I'm your host, Aaron Heathcock. Take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 72 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Now, if you will notice, I didn't do my intro like I normally do. This is actually an unplanned episode, and the show notes, I want to type them up as I go along, so there may not be any. But you can find the download link and what few show notes there will be, if any, by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 072. Lately, I've been very busy with work, and the last couple of days, my internet has been, shall we say, dead. Because of that, I've kind of shifted to a bi-weekly schedule for the podcast. I hope to get away from that. If I can't, well, I won't be able to for a while, then so be it. But if I can, I'm going to get back to a weekly schedule. Now, this particular episode is completely unplanned. And <laughs> in case you do hear my keyboard clacking, that's because I'm typing up what I'm planning to talk about. And the reason I say this show, this episode's unplanned, I, I had a whole different show planned out. It was ready to go and my power just flickered. Anyways, I had a whole different show planned out. It was ready to go, and we had an event. The event, uh, well, the event made that particular episode seem like it was, it seems like that episode would have been, that was the best way to put it. It seemed, it would have been inappropriate to do that episode. Let's just say that. You may be wondering what event I'm referring to. It didn't even happen in Texas. It was the college shooting in Oregon. There's a reason why the NRA does not give a statement on a shooting like this until there's been until everybody's had time to process what's happened. There is a reason why you don't see anybody issuing statements on things like well from the various state affiliates of the NRA. That's because everybody knows you have you have emotions running high and you can mess up, you can say something that it may seem like it may seem like the right thing to say at the time. However, it can be it can be detrimental to your position. It can be detrimental to it can be detrimental to the victims. And when I say it could be detrimental to your position, I don't mean you might say something like, We need to do something about this, let's endorse gun control. No. Because when you make an off the cuff statement, you may come out and you may say, Well, we've had this mass shooting. We know why all this evil is out there, and we got to do something about mental health. We have to go out. We have to, we have to lock all these insane people up in an asylum. Well, guess what? The American people aren't going to go for that. The American people are not really into mental asylums anymore, and there's a good reason for it. But we'll touch on that in a moment. Right now, I'm going to do something I normally do about this time. It's where I run the audio clip to tell you how to get the show. And then after that, I want to come back and I'm going to explain what the debate we need to have is and what four groups have a vested interest in gun rights and gun control. With that said, here's how to get the show. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, I said I would introduce the debate. The debate we need to have is not, we've already had a debate on gun control. And if we go back to this debate, we're rehashing things that, well, we're rehashing things that have already been hashed to death. Instead, the debate we need to have is on society, and it needs to be on mental health. You see, as a society, we need to, we need to change the way we approach the problem. We need, to approach, we need to change the way that we deal with the problem. And as a society, we need to look at what's causing this problem and deal with the actual source of the problem and not, not the tools used because... Let's face it, if you had some magic power to take away all the guns, you would have people driving cars or buses into people. This happened at South by Southwest. Or you might have people going around doing mass stabbings. Then you'd have to take away all the knives. 
And then people couldn't cut their meat. They'd be vegetarians, but they couldn't even cut their vegetables. And once you take away the knives, people would pick up rocks, and you'd have to take away all the rocks. And good luck with that one. In the end, you cannot do something to make society perfectly safe. You're going to have crazy people out there. And you have to deal with you have to deal with the fact that there are people out there, they're going out there, and they're committing this crime to get notoriety in society so that they can ensure that they will be remembered. They are doing this because they are mentally ill, and you have to do something about that. Now, there are four groups that have a vested interest in the gun rights and gun control debate, and these four groups should really look at changing this debate. The first group is obviously the gun rights movement. The second group is obviously the gun control movement. The third group third group is accused by both sides of being a part of the other side. But when you get right down to it, the third group really doesn't care about the debate. It makes their life a lot easier if it goes one particular way over the other, and that would be the criminal element of our society. When you have a disarmed society, the criminal element has a much easier time committing crimes. In fact, that criminal element will find itself running unopposed where before it could have been a life-threatening situation for them to content, to commit what they plan to do. Now, some people would say, well, if you take away the guns, the criminals wouldn't get guns. And yet, one of the one of the biggest sponsors of gun control legislation in California, poster child for the gun control groups there, he was, I believe he was a state senator. He might have been a state representative or whatever they call their legislature's uh, lower house. But his name was Leland Yee. And he got busted for weapon smuggling. Yep. He supported gun control, but he was still making money by smuggling or by being involved in the smuggling of weapons. And you may be think, wondering, why does that matter? Well, many years ago, there was a company that was importing weapons into the United States from China. They were operating under the name Norinco. They made some very nice 1911s. Actually, they're very high quality 1911s. They weren't 100% to spec, but they were nice quality guns that could easily be maintained, and they were actually rather impressive in the workmanship. They also imported, I believe it was SKS rifles, and they may have imported some uh, AK clones that were in semi-auto flavor. However, they got busted smuggling in fully automatic weapons for the gangs. We're not talking AR-15s or semi-auto AK-47s. We're talking full-auto AK-47s that can fire one round, or they can fire multiple rounds with each pull of the trigger. And it's illegal to import these guns into the United States unless you're importing them to law enforcement or military. But they were being imported and sold on the very cheap market to the gangs. Why? Because it was a source of revenue. Maybe they thought if they armed these gangs, it would make achieving some political goal they had easier. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is, Drugs are illegal, and people still get drugs. Meth is illegal, and people still make meth. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to completely ban guns because the criminal element will always be able to bring them in. The criminal element can take a tube of steel, a barrel to use as a barrel. They can take a nail to use as a firing pin. And with a little ingenuity, they can build a functional firearm. In fact, in Afghanistan, there are villages where the blacksmith is cranking out AK-47s with no special tooling. Think about that for a moment. You have villages in Afghanistan manufacturing AK-47s to use against American soldiers or whoever they want to use it against, maybe the Afghanistan government, and they're doing it with basic hand tools. No high-end machinery, nothing fancy needed. They're just bending and shaping sheet metal, attaching a tube, and maybe they're filing a few pieces of scrap metal down into specific shapes. And they have an AK-47 that they can sell to get a new wife or buy some land to grow drugs on to import, so they can export that to the United States. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is, you have these guns being manufactured on the easy. And here's the scary thing to the gun banners. Gun control is such a failure on banning guns. In Japan, where guns are completely illegal... A man was arrested for printing multiple firearms on a 3D printer. We've had 3D firearms developed here. In fact, 3D firearms are kind of a kind of the bread and butter, and I think it were invented by, or 3D printed firearms were invented by, a group called 
distributed defense, if I remember correctly. And if I remember correctly, they're based here in Texas. What I'm, what I'm getting at is, like methamphetamines, you will have homegrown weapons, and you will have weapons imported from outside the country. So you will never get rid of the weapons that the criminals get. And as a result of that, the criminals really don't care how the gun rights and gun control debate goes. You know, it'll make their lives safer if we get gun control, because then the then the uh, armed citizens won't have any way to fight back, because they will no longer be armed citizens. But then there's a fourth group, and the fourth group is the ones standing on the sidelines, scratching their head, wondering, why the hell can we make any progress on this problem? And that group is the the American population in general. These are the people who they they don't care about gun rights because they don't own guns. They don't care about gun control because they don't own guns. It's real easy to push these people into one camp or the other because all you got to do is give them a vested interest in this fight. You take somebody in the general American population and you throw down a lot of violence that involves firearms, you have gun control advocates pop up and say, you know, reassuring things and get get them to say, you know, get them to understand their point of view and they'll become gun control advocates. At the same time, you take them to the range, introduce them to safe firearms handling, and let them see that it's fun, it's relaxing, and it's perfectly safe if it's done properly. And they begun they become gun owners, which means they become they become pro gun people. But I think I think the general American population starting to get sick of it. I think they're seeing this problem and they want something done about it. And we're going to talk about that. First, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. Then I'll come back and I'll explain why the debate's already been argued, why we need a different debate, and then I'll introduce the new debate that we need, and then we'll go from there. Now, with that said, here's how to find the show on social media. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, we're back, and we're going to talk about why the debate has already been argued and why we need a new debate. First off, why has this debate already been argued? Well, we have thousands of gun control laws in this country, and not a one of them has prevented these mass shootings. We have gun rights advocates that every time new legislation in certain parts of the country is introduced, they stomp it down. We have gun control advocates. Every time new pro-gun legislation is introduced in parts of the country, they stomp it down. You have parts of the country that have gone to one side of the debate. You have parts of the country that have gone to the other side of the debate. And the truth of the matter is, the debate's been argued, depending on where you're at, it's been won. It's been won by the pro-gun advocates on in certain areas. It's been won by the pro-gun control people in others. As a nation... We have chosen to follow the middle ground and let the states decide, for the most part. But then, then you see where every state in the Union has some kind of concealed carry law. Most states in the Union have an open carry law. Texas will soon be joining them when House Bill 910 actually goes into effect on January 1st of 2016. You have anti-gun victories like, well, you have the Brady background check. That was a compromise. The NRA won. The anti-gunners won. Why? Because both sides said, hey, we need something to keep people that are not supposed to have guns away from having or keep them from having these guns. It improved what we had before where there was a three-day waiting period and no background check to where we had an instant background check and you could walk away with your gun when you passed. Some people might say that's not really a great thing to have, but it is. When you buy a new gun, you have to get a background check. Some people want to extend that to all firearms. But there's a problem with that. When you extend it to all firearms, you make felons out of people doing everyday normal things. Let's say me and you go hunting. We're out. We're dove hunting. It's September 1. We both have our hunting license. I bring my favorite shotgun, but I bring another shotgun that I just bought. I want to see how it does, and if it doesn't please me, I want to switch back to my favorite. We go out. I bust a bird. Hey, I like this new shotgun. This may become my new uh, dove hunting shotgun. You bust a, you see a bird, 
you line your sights, you press the trigger, nothing happens, you eject the shell that didn't fire, you look at it, and there's not a Mark One on the primer. Your gun has failed. Hey, we don't have to go back into town and get another gun or ruin our day by going into town and doing all that. Just go grab my extra gun out of the pickup or the Jeep or whatever we're in. So you go over there, you get my extra gun, and as the law is now, guess what? Nothing has happened illegal. But if we go to the background checks for every time somebody transfers a firearm, we would have committed a felony. I won't go into details like why why it would be inconvenient to go back into town, do a transfer on a gun, go out there and hunt, and then go back into town again and do a transfer from, from you to me on my gun. I won't do that. What I will do, I will explain that such things would actually be cost prohibitive. It would spike the NICS system where it would not be able to meet the demand. The NICS system would have to uh, hire 10 times as many agents in the FBI to run background checks and to keep up with demand, which means taxes would go up. They would have to start charging fees just to do background checks. Background check fees at the FFLs would go up. And then you would have people being delayed their rights because, well, John Smith, that's carrying, that's wanting to borrow a shotgun for hunting, has the same name as John Smith, the 15-time convicted felon who was just released on parole uh, two towns over and may just be buying a gun in this gun store, so we're going to delay him. Well, there's problems like that. It's a far greater and more intricate issue when you go and look at the whole universal background checks. But keep in mind, both sides have won victories in the debate that we've had on gun rights and gun control. It's time to have a new debate. It's a time to have a debate on what will fix the problem. First off, nobody can go out there and kill another human being with no probable, with no provocation, with no reasonable purpose and be sane. It's one thing to kill somebody in self-defense. It's one thing to kill somebody in defense of a third party. It's a whole different thing to go out there and kill somebody just because you couldn't get some girl to do the deed with you. That's a sign of somebody that has a mental health issue. And there are a lot more signs that lead up to, the, to where he gets there before he gets there. The problem is Americans don't want to have a mental health debate. And we have good reason. And we'll touch on that in a moment. But first, I also have to introduce, as part of the new debate, we have to change society. We have to change the way society reacts to these shootings. We have to change the way society handles these shootings. And we have to change the way society leads up to these shootings. The episode I had planned was for, for episode 72 was about campus carry. That would have been inappropriate considering the college shooting. Some people might say, well, that'd be actually more appropriate. However, I don't want to go into having the debate on campus carry so soon after we have this mass shooting and everybody's emotions are running high. Let everybody calm down where they can think with a clear head and then we can have that debate. But the debate we need to have is about changing society. We have to change society so that it's acceptable to defend yourself. It's acceptable to defend others. And as a whole, this is already the case. But there's certain areas where we feel and nobody should be able to do that. Consider this. You have a gun-free zone. Let's, let's say it's a college in Oregon. It's so gun-free that the only security guard on campus does not get to have a gun. That's pretty gun-free. Now, you have your gun-free zone. Everybody that's a law-abiding citizen is going to abide by the law, and they're not going to carry in your gun-free zone. The thing about criminals is they commit crimes. That's where the crim and criminal comes from is the word crime. In fact, crime is the first part of the word criminal. (sighs) Okay, so you take your criminal, and he's got three choices where to go commit his mass shooting and get notoriety. He can go to the police station where the vast majority of the people are going to be armed. He can go to the gun store where he knows at least somebody will be armed, or he can go to the gun-free zone where he knows nobody will be armed. If he's wanting to do this to get to get a name for himself, to go out in a blaze of glory where people will always remember him, that's what he's going to do. He's not going to go shoot up the police station because he'll be a byline 
attempted shooter at police station was shot dead by 15 officers. Autopsy results are pending. He goes to the gun store. He will be remembered as man attempts to rob gun store was shot dead by gun store clerk or gun stone gun store owner autopsy results pending or he can go to the gun free zone and shoot people until he either runs out of ammunition or law enforcement takes minutes to get there and stops him what's he going to do he's going to ignore the law he's going to carry his gun into the gun free zone and he's going to have his way until somebody finally gets a gun there and stops him this is not this is not speculation this is common sense and we have to change society we have to stop giving these people what they want when they go out there and they commit these shootings they want notoriety they want their name to be remembered pick any four pick any five pick any 20 shootings where you've had more than four people killed and go look it up on wikipedia you'll find the shooter's name search the news for these shootings you'll find the shooter's name he got his notoriety he got his fame he went out in a blaze of glory or he got captured and he's awaiting trial and he'll get more glory or at least that's what he thinks we have to change that we have to change where these gun free zones are we have to eliminate them except where there is armed response forces Uh, man i'm messing that up where you have armed individuals that can respond instead of unarmed security guards Imagine if each building on that campus had an armed security guard. Mass shooter goes in, starts to shoot people, armed security guard hears it, runs towards the sound of the gunfire, sees the shooter, pops him in the head, case closed. You may have two, three dead. Imagine, and that's a worst case scenario, you may have no dead. Now imagine instead of armed security guard, shooter goes in the classroom, pulls his gun, And the teacher who's standing over on the side draws his gun, as does half the class, and they all shoot him dead. You have nobody killed other than the lunatic that's trying to kill people. I assure you, they will go find softer targets. Criminals always go for the soft, fleshy parts of society. And the soft, fleshy parts of society, if you're going to steal Wi-Fi, is the unencrypted Wi-Fi. You're not going to stop and bother to crack somebody's Wi-Fi. Why? Because if you go down the block, you're going to find somebody that doesn't have an encrypted Wi-Fi signal and you can just steal theirs. Criminals are not going to go steal the car that's locked in a secured garage inside of a secured building that has some kind of disabling system to keep it from being started. And you'd have to put the wheels on it to load it on a flatbed truck. Criminals aren't going to do that. They're going to go down to the car that's running outside the house that's unattended while the person that owns the vehicle is inside waiting for the car to warm up in the middle of winter, they're going to go, they're going to open that car that's sitting there running unattended and they're going to take it. And you're going to have a few that will go in. They will steal the harder vehicle to get because, well, it's worth more. But as a general rule, car thieves are going to go for the easier targets. If you leave your keys in your car, it's more likely to get stolen than if you have your car locked in your garage. So as a society, we need to change society where these mass shootings are less likely to happen because, one, their objective of being remembered doesn't happen. Two, it's much harder to commit this crime because there are no more gun-free zones where you can go and you can shoot people indiscriminately for minutes until somebody shows up with a gun and a badge, then hunts you down, and when they finally find you, they engage you in a firefight And so that you don't get taken alive, you shoot yourself. No, this will end when that situation cannot happen anymore. I'm not saying everybody has to carry a gun. I'm not saying everybody should carry a gun. I am saying that as a society, we should let everybody have the choice whether or not they're going to carry a gun when they're out and about in public. Some people will make that choice when they commit a crime and they lose that right to carry that gun. But they made that choice. And we have to change society's attitude towards these shootings and towards how these shootings happen and we have to change society's attitude towards mental health the people that have real honest to god mental health issues need to be sent through a system of due process and when they go through this system that is based on due process they need to be they need to go into 
a facility that will help them get better until due process says, okay, you are well, you may go back out into society because we don't think you're that much of a threat anymore. Or they will say, look, you're still a threat to society. We got to help you get better before you can go. And this due process has to be based on our criminal system. We cannot have a system like we did back when we had asylums and people that were embarrassing to the family got locked up in the asylum where somebody that was a political enemy got locked up in the asylum. There was no due process and just about anybody could be committed. All you had to do was be higher than them in the society and you could have anybody you wanted committed. Well, that's why Americans have the attitude they do towards mental health. There was no due process and it was a horrible system. It was abused. And we have to do something about that. We have to get people that need mental health help that help until they're no longer a threat to society. We are getting people help, but we're not keeping them from harming society. We're not keeping them from harming themselves. And we have to do that. Right now, only in extreme cases can somebody be committed forcefully to a mental hospital where they can be forced to get help. It's a very difficult process, and it should be easier. But it shouldn't be so easy that politician A can have upcoming politician C locked up because politician C disagrees with him on stuff and he thinks politician C might win an election. We can't have a situation where somebody that's a little bit slow gets locked up in a mental health institution because they got pregnant or they got another individual pregnant and they embarrassed their family. We cannot have that. And these were, this is what happened back in the days of the asylums. And we have to put a system in place that keeps that from happening. Maybe we should have a system based on our legal system where you have a quote-unquote grand jury that rather than being a grand jury of peers, because no grand jury is a grand jury of peers, you have a grand jury of mental health experts. And they decide, yes, there is sufficient evidence that this person is a threat to society that we are going to allow this case to go forward and go to trial so that this person can be tried and determined if they are mentally handicapped to the point that they are a threat to society and must be locked up until they are better. And then they go to a trial and this person can defend themselves or they can have hired help defend them. These checks and balances were, or these checks on the system were never implemented before. And we got to have that. Would it mean more cost for society? Yeah but the benefits, I believe, would be worth it. You wouldn't have people whose names we shall not mention on this podcast going around and committing murders in mass. You might have a few still do it, but it would not be at the level that it is now. You know what? Before I go any further, because I'm half asleep, my internet looks like it may be coming back to life, I'm going to run the audio that tells you how to contact the show, and then I'm going to come back. I'm going to wrap this up. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Okay, we're back and I'm going to wrap this thing up. The new debate must be a victory for Americans. There's no two ways about it. We have to stop the insanity. We have to change society. We have to change our mental health system. And we have to put checks and balances in place where society says, if you do this, you are going to be rat holed back into the deepest, darkest corner that we can find in the history books. And your name will not be mentioned, nor will your picture be shown. You will not be remembered by anybody 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Your name will not be remembered anywhere. 20 minutes from now, or 20 minutes after you commit this crime, your name will not be known outside of law enforcement for their investigation. And we have to change America's attitude towards mental health issues. If we don't do this, these people that are a threat to society will continue to walk around and commit these crimes. Nobody and I mean nobody who has any decency wants to see children killed. Nobody that's anybody with any kind of decency wants to see the slaughter of innocents. And as Americans, as Texans, 
we have to accept that there is evil out there in the world. And we have to accept that the only way you can fight evil is to fight evil. You can't just let it run amok. You can't ignore it and hope it goes away. You cannot take away whatever tool it prefers at the moment because it will come back with a different tool. Instead, you have to take away its cause. You have to take away its goal. And you have to take away it. You have to take away its desire to commit this evil act. And when you do that, you will still have problems because there will still be evil in the world. But there will be less evil. Or at least there will be less evil running out there. With that said, please stay safe, carry responsibly, and come back for episode 73. If everything goes according to plan, I'll have something interesting for that one. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.